Um, good morning, Paul of our Jack. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> um, I should say that uh, Paula, because this is obviously audio and not video, has an absolutely beautiful, a very peaceful uh, Monet lily pond as her backdrop, um, which is very nice. It's very nice for me to look at. I, on the other hand, have got a very tatty uh, cabaret curtain, so uh, that's where we're at in our di- <laughs> in our different environments. Um, Paula, could I just wanted to check in, see how you're doing this morning? Um, yeah, I would. I would say how I am doing is. Uh best expressed by this sound huh yeah it's a good sound isn't it and a bit of a shrug a, like a light a gentle shrug after the yeah. fact and is that okay like just that sort of light shrug vibe is that okay for now yeah I think so it's like I, I read an interview with um Carrie Washington that I think was actually from ages ago where she said at the beginning of the interview, the interview interviewer was like, how are you? And she said, you know, COVID okay. And I was like, yeah, that, I know what that means. Like COVID okay. Like I'm okay, I guess, for the times that we are in. Yeah, that's a really useful expression, isn't it? Actually, because we, I don't think we can measure anything by before or what might come. Is it everything's about, about now, isn't it? So it's good to, to hear that. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking time. Um, I was going to ask you if it was okay if you could just describe yourself, just because you do so many, I mean, I knew some of the amazing things you did, and then I looked at your website, and I was like, I'm not even going to try, and so <laughs> if it's okay, could you describe um, yourself in however you would like to introduce yourself? Uh, I would say that I am a artist working in performance, video, and participation. Um, sometimes all those things at once, often all those things at once. Generally, I have um, a question or a theme that I'm really preoccupied with that uh, whatever work I'm making is a way of exploring that question, not not answering it, but exploring it and hopefully creating more dialogue around it. So previously, for example, um, I made uh, an installation that looked at how people were connecting on on dating apps and how they found that experience. Um, I, probably the work I guess I'm best known for is a project called Show Me the Money, which was a, a video and performance project looking at how to survive or not from a living as an artist within the UK. Um, after that, I made shows looking at my relationship to high fashion, like what is it about brands, um, what it means to be a, an older woman who doesn't have children in a society that seems to often conflate maturity as a woman with um, motherhood. And then the next project I'm kind of really in the middle of making right now it looks at what it means to be foreign and female um and also how those conversations take place on social media wow I love that you um I love what, uh, how you described it that you you ask a question or you start with a question without the intention of necessarily answering it but exploring it I think that's really fantastic just as a person that interacts with work I really enjoy it when I'm when I'm invited to think as well, rather than it's really beautiful. And hopefully, it's lovely that you summarise those things. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to talk about some of them, um, which is which is really great. Before we get onto that, just because um, I sometimes a little bit meander over from the fact that this podcast is supposed to be about hope, and hope is this sort of beating heart of it. So just to sort of remind us about, it feels increasingly important, actually, I wondered if if there was anything that made you feel hopeful this week. It's absolutely, I hope it goes without saying, allowed to say no. You're absolutely allowed to because it's COVID times. But I just wondered if there was anything and what that might have been. Yeah, I think I I feel like I had um, maybe not. I don't know whether to call it an epiphany or like a revelation. But I've I've been preoccupied for a really really long time. What the word digital means and what it means to connect with people or any kind of relationship online and online spaces. Like that's been of interest to me since like the early days of the internet. But over the last year, um, I've been increasingly interested in like what it means to work more on, on online platforms and what it means to create work for devices. Um, And I've actually found that quite exciting and inspiring and, and um, interesting to explore but I've been feeling a little bit grim at the start of the year because most people that I, I, I know within the world of performing arts 
do not share that that excitement, um, which is completely understandable because if you if you went into the medium of performing arts because you want to be in spaces with people, it is a very, very different way of, of making work. But this this week, I've had a series of instances um, that have made me feel quite inspired and hopeful about um, the, the, the potential of working in this way and also of, about the idea that, yes, there there are other people who share that desire. It's just maybe I haven't quite found them yet or I haven't really thought enough about about who I know who shares his interests. And like some kind of strange serendipity, suddenly a series of conversations um, and interactions have made me realize, oh, there are people out there. And also I haven't really put the call out yet. I think I've been putting a lot of energy into maybe trying to convince people of something that they don't want to be convinced of. And I think my new tack for 2021 is not about persuading or convincing people, but finding the other people who like me want to go on that journey and are also excited to explore. So that feels like a little element of hope that's opening up just in this week. Absolutely, 100% to that. I think it's so wise and also kind to yourself to do exactly what you said, was actually find the people that are already saying yes as well, rather than trying to persuade people who aren't there and who might never not be there it's really interesting as well Paula because I've been thinking about the digital interaction for artists as well and I and I realized it's very kind of almost unconscious and not a haven't even really realized I did it but if I'm honest I test quite a lot of projects out on social media I'll just and it's not I, I've only recently become conscious of that and, and I'm really interested in sort of storytelling and sharing on those platforms as well, really interested. And I've done it for years, but without being aware I was doing it. So I think it's a really interesting investigation. And also, yeah, to acknowledge we miss breathing and sweating and being with each other in rooms or outdoors and, and all of that as well. So it's complicated. I am actually feel really hopeful that what we'll look forward to in the future is we'll keep some of the beautiful stuff we found out about Zoom, for example, which means I can be in a room with someone from California. That's wonderful, you know, and more democratic in a way. And also get back some of the, you know, actually, I, I'm at the Camden People's Theatre watching you doing a show and enjoying that, you know. So hopefully there's lots of lovely things there. Um, So I was recalling Paula with great joy the moment that we met, which was actually in a strange sort of pretend changing rooms at the Royal Albert Hall when we were both about to do a gig for the amazing um, feminist uh, book publisher for book's sake and promoter of, of spoken word and uh, literature in general and I remember just being really impressed you kind of breezed in you had an amazing outfit on you changed into another amazing outfit and I kind of wasn't I think I might have been drinking coffee and I looked up and I was like she's like this sort of pink goddess it was, it was and I hadn't even I was like she did that in five seconds and also in my memory you put makeup on without looking which I is a skill I greatly admire I think of it as a sort of cabaret skill because cabaret I have to do that a lot and also we just had such a lovely night I just thought it was a beautiful night it was kind of a quite a magical um Everything came together. It was just felt like a really lovely thing. So it was very nice. And that night, uh, we had a table on of all of our wares. I didn't have any wares, actually, I don't think. But some people had wares. And one of your wares was your amazing manifesto for artists in a crumbling arts economy, which was beautifully pink and black and just so powerful. And I bought it. It's in a terrible state now. I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> it's moved around. It's got, it's well loved, Paula. <laughs> It's changed walls, it's been in different places. I found it enormously, enormously comforting and just brilliant. And I would recommend anybody getting a copy of it because it's just brilliant. And I, it just seems really pertinent to now and, and really relevant um, for me in terms of the conversation about hope. I wondered if you um, could talk a little bit about the manifesto to people listening, what drove you to write it when you did. And whether you found it, as I have, sort of even more relevant now as, as the community of artists, the broad community of artists and creatives have struggled like a lot of other industries during this time. That's really loads of questions jammed into one question. 
about your amazing um, manifesto for artists in a, in a crumbling arts economy. So could you talk a little bit about it? Yeah, so the, the manifesto, which is, it's really interesting how it's kind of come into another, it's sort of like a resurgence actually in the, la in the last year, but um, it was part of a, a show that I made uh, called um, Show Me the Money. Well, Show Me the Money, to be honest, it wasn't, it wasn't just a, a show. The idea is it was a, a research and performance project. Um, so I interviewed 44 artists um, across the UK, different ages, uh, career stages, um, performance levels. Um, and I had a really, really, really broad uh, interpretation of the word artist. So that included, there were, there were comedians, um, there were singers, there were, there were poets, there were musicians, there were theater makers, there were performance artists and so on. Like I interviewed a little girl who was four who wanted to be a singer when she grew up. I interviewed a um, 60 plus actress who had only just bought a house with her partner and was only just starting to feel like some sense of stability and, and everything in between. And, and, I, and I went all around the country and um, uh, d during the devising of it, I was, I, I was really, really like uh, most of my energy was in like, how do I use this project to, to kind of save myself in a way? Cause I kind of had like an early crisis at the beginning of how am I ever meant to sustain, sustain making work like this? Um, but also kind of figuring out how can I share out all this learning I was getting from all these different artists. And I remember um, at the time I was mentoring a number of artists for, uh, for a project with the, with the Barbican. And because I was really in the thick of my research, I was constantly sharing links of all this stuff that I was finding about advocacy and about you know, issues that artists had in the sector. And I shared a blog and I remember, <laughs> I remember share, being in this mentoring session and two of the artists I was mentoring going, yeah, we read it, but um, it, just makes, it just makes me feel really depressed because it just seems like I knew things are hard, but wow, things are really hard and I don't know however I'm gonna make it in this industry. And I, and I remember I came home and I felt really frustrated because I was like, no, that, that wasn't what I wanted them to go, oh, wow, I need to know what I'm getting into and I wanna be ready for it, I wanna galvanize, but I want them to have a sense of hope and I still want them to go into the sector and how do they make, make them feel like it's not, um, it's not over before they've even began. And so I, I really thought about all the different advice that I'd gotten from all these different artists of all the interviews that I'd made. And, and I, wrote, I wrote this manifesto based on that. It's, it's, it's almost a crowdsourced in my body. I couldn't even tell you exactly who said what. There are maybe a handful of sentences I, I can remember. And I don't even think they were exactly it's like verbatim, like they were said, the, it's written the way they were said to me, but I know that it was what I had gleaned from talking to these 44 artists. And then I think the first time I read it was, was actually before, before the show was even devised. So I was part of an event at the Free Words um, headed by a project with Femi Martin. It was um, a, number of, a number of writers who had been invited to work with people who, had, who were incarcerated through the Free Word. And I remember there was this conference, which it's like sold out three times. We kept having to move to a bigger and bigger space. And, the, and I read it for the first time. I remember being really emotional reading out loud for the first time and feeling like I, I, I really, I had really created something that felt important and felt useful. And I knew it was going to be something that in the show, the show builds to this, this point of, of sharing all these answers. Um, then I guess around the time Show Me the Money finished, which I mean, what is time at this moment? I get really confused, but I want to say it was 20, maybe 2016, the first iteration of the show. <laughs> Bernadette's really laughing. Um, just, it's just, um, it's interesting that you mentioned that year as well, uh, Paula, just as a, because 2016 feels like when everything suddenly got a little bit darker. <laughs> Because I have this book on my bookshelf, actually, and it says, excuse my language, Fuck You 2016. Um, it was brought out as a sort of lighthearted book because we had a lot of stuff going on then, the whole Brexit conversation. A lot of stuff was emerging, wasn't it? And now I look back and like, oh, boy, we didn't even know. We didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, tr yeah, it's true. Interesting. It's interesting that it was that year. Yeah, it was, it, was running in, it was running into that year. And then I think, I'm trying to think about the poster then I had a kind of like Instagrammable thumbnail of it 
Um, and then my uh, my partner, who is is also very often my collaborator, Ben Gregory, is like a really talented designer and graphic designer. And I said, oh, I think I think I want some merch for the tour, and I think it would be cool to make this into a poster. And so he reformatted, which was this very social media friendly Instagram little square thumbnail, into this into this poster. And I kind of started selling them. But the funny thing is, like, I don't think I ever really really pushed selling them when I was touring it as much as I could have done. I think I kind of, I never seemed to have enough with me. And I often was just like giving them to, to artistic directors of venues that, that I was, I was in. And then it was only the funny thing about the reprint is that um, I, I, I became like a associate artist with, with them um, through the Pleasance, the London Pleasance associate scheme. And I, I, I'd been having a, like everyone a really rough year last year. And I, and one of the things that maybe we'll talk about in a bit was, uh, I, I, had, I, my father passed here and there were, there were a series of things that I really wanted to do kind of in his honor that were kind of creative outputs. Um, and one of them was I, I wanted to do some kind of stream of archival footage of show me the money, but find a way to do it in some kind of different way. And I wanted to sell tickets for it because I wanted to, to raise money and I couldn't figure out how to go about it. And then I was talking to, <laughs> I was talking to um, Nick Connaughton, who's the artistic director at the London Pleasance, and really feeling quite low about things. And he was like, "You should really, you know, you should really sell those posters again. Like, I think people really would want those posters right now. I think you'd be, I think you'd be really surprised what kind of demand there would be." And I was like, "Oh, I don't know. I mean, I got, like I've got like I think I, I think I've got like ten in the house. Maybe we could sell those ten. And then I, <laughs> I put them." I put them in my newsletter and they sold, they sold out. Like, I think I remember clicking send a newsletter and then they were just gone. Like they were immediately just gone. I was I'm like, not surprised. Oh, that's, yeah. and it's now I'm on my, on my third, my third print. I can't, I've, I think I'm, I think I've done like, it's almost become like this bi-weekly thing. I put out the newsletter. I'm like, I've got 20 or whatever it is or 25. And then they just sell and they every, every single time. And it's become this weird thing that's been part of my, my, my routine of putting the listing out, sitting in the afternoons, watching telly, rolling up these posters. And then, and then in addition to that, posting pictures of them framed in their, in their homes. And I, and it's really exciting for me, but I'm, to be honest, I'm still a bit, I'm still a little bit in shock that they're as popular <laughs> as they are. I mean, I can understand why they are, but I guess it's, it's, um, and I stand by all the advice in it. And I think, and I, and I do think it's something about hope, right? I think yeah. it, they're, me they're meaningful for people because they speak to a collective idea of, yeah. of hope, I but I'm, but I feel like I probably need to sit with it and, uh, and kind of let the advice stick in for myself again, because at the moment I'm just really stuck into the, I, I got to do this thing. I got to, I got to get this thing out. And it's like a little mini, st mini store. And it's really, yeah. I don't know. That's the story of the reprint. I think it's incredible. It, it, it's, I, I've sort of stayed with it. I thought actually it's really lovely to have something you can put on your wall with beautiful words, strong, powerful words that you can look at and you can keep looking at it. You can ignore it for a bit and that's okay and it's there and it's sometimes it feels like a nice really welcome little bit of wood in a stormy sea whenever the ship's gone <laughs> so I think it's 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 brilliant that you did it and I think it's also very interesting about you know for us as wordy people what words best work how words can help support hope it, and which platforms are best for that, you know, and how and it's just really super interesting, I think, what actually is the most effective form of delivery that will be different for each thing. But I, I just think it's amazing. And I'm going to make sure in the copy for the podcast, even though it's going to give you more work whilst you're watching telly in your pajamas, rolling them up. <laughs> I'm going to encourage everybody that's listening to buy one because I can't. And thank you so much because it's been super helpful. Um, I just want to take you back a little bit. Hopefully you'll like this. I've been. I've been sort of really interested and in thinking a lot about what I've been calling sort of origin stories. Mainly, I'm going to be honest with you, Paula, because I've been watching, I'm investigating here that kind of idea about heroes and have been for a number of years. And I'm watching loads mm. of Marvel <laughs> films. And I thought, actually, it's amazing. A, I know, right? It's a really useful way of saying to yourself, OK, what what's my origin story? I find it quite useful. Like, what what's the thing that, you know, 
made me make the choices I was. So um, I just wondered for you, in terms of your childhood, little Paula growing up, were you, did you, did you grow up in a creative family? What was the thing that made you think, okay, I'm going to, I'm an artist. And, you know, when did that begin for you in terms of your origin story? I mean, I definitely like my early, my earliest memories are of wanting to be wanting to do something creative or, I mean, I'm an only child. So a lot of be entertaining myself was making up stories or play acting things with toys or drawing something or writing little poems. Um, but actually funny because then show me the money. Um, one of the first stories I, I, I tell in it in terms of my origin story of deciding to be an artist is I had a I had an uncle Ted who technically wasn't wasn't my uncle. He was the my family is very complicated, but effectively he was he was the stepdad of um of my aunt. And uh he was an incredible draftsman um and painter. Um he was always like really impeccably turned out, but he was already quite elderly when I was a child. And he lived in a uh, council state in southeast London and kind of like supported living situation. And I remember um, he, I have a re one of my really, really earliest memories is visiting him. And he used to make where you kind of pull the string in the middle and then the wings flap on either side, like yes. kind of flying mobile or, or something. Um, and so I remember he made these for children uh, in hospitals. And there was something about being crafty and being good with hands. And I felt really, he was probably like the most magical adult I met. When I was when I was little, and there, but there was also something already implanted in my head of like, oh, this person is like he spends his time painting and writing, and he also is he's living in a way he's living in a really tiny apartment with a lot of stuff, and he seems really happy. I felt like he had a completely different energy um, than other other adults I had met at that time, and I um, so I would definitely say he made a really big he made a really big. Um, uh, influence on me and the idea of being an artist but I think also also as part of my origin story I would definitely say is that my my grandfather on my mother's side who I never met um, was a was a teacher and a statesman but he was also a poet and he was a published poet and he was he had he had many kind of quite notable um, literary friends because he was he was an ambassador uh, for forgot around the time that it got its uh, independence is like the first independent African country. And so during the Pan-African movement, many African-American writers came to Ghana. And so um, he met Maya Angelou and then Maya Angelou told many other African-American writers that uh, Michael Dianning was really sympathetic to the African-American cause. And when, when he was living here briefly, a friend of his brought James Baldwin around the house. And so the sense of like being a poet yeah, being a poet and being um, involved in literature was highly regarded. Yeah. But I guess, I guess, yeah. alongside that was that um, he did that, but that was not his way of making a living. So I think that I had an interest in poetry was definitely encouraged. But I don't think there was a sense of, and then this is a thing that you're gonna <laughs> make a living in necessarily from from the outset. So I think there's something around that. Um, I also have an uncle who's a who's a really talented painter actually but who's also a neurosurgeon and I was aware of him having a studio and painting and having exhibitions and and so on um so there are people in my family who are creative definitely but I'm the only person who uh, has chosen to do it as the thing that they do full full time that's still something that's kind of quite unusual on both sides of the family I would say but but my parents used to joke that maybe the seed was planted in the fact that they used to go to the theater a lot when they were dating and um I think <laughs> I like that <laughs> and in fact actually I can I can connect it back to our origin story because my mom um in her early working days was a secretary for the Woburn Institute which is like an ex part of the um of SOAS at UCL mm -hmm. and her boss had a box at the Royal Albert Hall oh wow but whenever there was a like a season box roller hall. So whenever there was something that um, he didn't want to see, like, you know, a pop music concert or something, then he'd give mom um, his tickets to the box at the Royal Albert Hall. Wow. And so my mom and my dad, you know, like young people would go see stuff 
there. So look, I've even linked us back together with that. Let's get look that. that. It's an, it's amazing uh, space, I think. I mean, it's just an in, incredible, really amazing space. What a brilliant experience for your for your parents. And for you, Paula, when you yes. made that decision, whether it was a, um, which I think we have to acknowledge, there's a lot of courage, I think, that we don't acknowledge with making that decision to try somehow and make a, a career out of being an artist. What was one of the, the very first art projects you did kind of that you would describe as a professional project? So I guess, I guess I would may, I would maybe say it would be um, because I went to, I've sort of had this really cyclical journey with theater where I, I started off wanting to be a theater director and my, my practical way of doing that and making a living was I got training in stage management because I thought, Oh, that's a job I can get pretty much right out of, right out of my training. And then I can be next to the director and yeah. then eventually I'll find my way up to being a director. That didn't work out because I went to drama school and found that I really, really, <laughs> I really, really, hated um the concept of theater that we were being taught and the whole vibe of lots and lots of things so I went to film school but the point of that is after film school I I the first project I had that I guess that I was paid to do was to do a kind of promo documentary um of a of a lesbian beauty pageant oh wow and um I would say that that project was probably to me, it felt like my first professional project in, in so much as um, someone was someone was paying me to create a thing um, and I had a team on board to deliver that and I felt like the end result was really slick. And I'm very angry because I have no idea. I think I've moved so many times that I have no idea where that material is. Like it exists no. somewhere. I was also, the first time I got in a... Um, a kind of IP battle with someone because in the end I was like, oh, I want to submit this to festivals and so on. Yeah. And the and the person who paid me to make the promo was like, no, because because I own this. I would so I'd say that was my first professional experience of of making something. Maybe. That sounds great. I want to see that, but I can't. I would I would love to know where it is. <laughs> where it is. Yes. It's probably on a on a mini DV cassette in a box somewhere in my parents' house, which is where I am now living for the foreseeable future. So maybe maybe I need to make it a project with all this extra time we're meant to have to to find it. Yeah, I think you're going to find it. I feel optimistic about that. Um I want to get on to talk about some of your projects that I'm more familiar with and really like. But before I do that, I wanted to say to you um what, I know this is an incredibly difficult question, but I wondered if you could pick a project of what you've done so far that's um, in ancient history or recent, um, which for you is really important, it's made you particularly happy or been very satisfying or just really important. So I guess I'm kind of asking you to pick a, a, a favourite child, which is impossible, or favourite record. Um, but I wondered if you could sort of um, talk a little bit about something that's really um, sort of a headline for you at the moment in terms of your projects that feels really precious. Oh yeah, that's su that's super hard because I I, I kind of think when I think of when I think of a project that's like quote unquote important, which I guess for me is about affecting affecting change. Um, then I often I think about show me the money because it because I I felt like I could in a demonstrable way I could see impact that it had on the sector and my holding myself in the sector, but I also feel like I've spoken about it a lot. So I'm kind of quite happy, maybe not to go into it so much. I'm really excited about the project that I'm in the middle of making right now. Um, I'm Alanya with my collaborator, Chuck Blue Lowry. Um, uh, so that's kind of interesting in terms of what it's speaking to in this, in this present time and like, in development but then if I was going to respond to this as a what's a project that I'm just proud of and I enjoyed then I would probably talk about the cult of Kenzo which is obviously the one that you're familiar with so yeah. we, could, we could do that yeah I know I feel like you and I could talk for hours and there's so much to dig into so, and I know it's a really incredibly difficult question but I did I came to see the cult of Kenzo which I was so delighted with and it stayed with me. In fact, I was talking about it with my um, collaborator, Sophie Austin, yesterday. Uh, we were talking about um, how people are dressing differently. We're having quite a funny conversation about clothes. And I 
I was just, I don't, I'm sure that I've not, um, I'm going to um, not express all, all of the ideas that you spoke about in it, but it really made me think about the connection between fashion and how we can improve our mental health, but also personal style, how we can kind of fix ourselves from the outside in rather from the inside out. It just made me think a lot about that, as well as making me consider the fashion industry, because my friend Sarah Corbett, who's a activist does a lot of stuff she loves fashion but she thinks a lot about trying to change the industry for the better in terms of climate change employment right workers etc so yeah I'd love to talk about the cult of Kenzo um you were amazing in it and it was super entertaining and really beautiful and a great story um but yeah t tell us a little bit about that and what the main themes were and the reason you did it etc so the the cult the cult of Kenzo is a show I suppose that at its heart is trying to, as I said, like every time I make something, there's a preoccupation that I'm, I'm kind of trying to work out. Like, what is it, what is it about this um, that I'm going through? Um, I bet other people have that experience. What does it say about culture at large? And the cult of Kenzo started with this really, really bizarre experience I had queuing um, in the middle of the night or the early hours of the morning, depending on how you look at time, for one of these collaborative uh, collections between the high end, or actually I now know it's not even technically high end, high street premium <laughs> line Kenzo um, and H&M, which is obviously like a, a high street brand. And it was this thing where it was like going on an odyssey. Like I, I, I wanted to buy this dress. Um, I was excited about the dress because it looked it looked incredible, but also because it was connected to a label I normally couldn't access. It was being modeled by uh, actresses that I, I really look up to and find amazing. I thought I could just buy it in a store. I realized, you know, no, no, you can't just buy these collections in the store, that there's these like intricate rituals around trying to, to get them and like reselling and all this stuff. And it was like getting into this underworld. Like the more, the more I found out about it, the more I wanted to have this experience. And I just remember walking out of H&M in Westfield at like nine o'clock in the morning, having been there since like, you know, quarter, quarter to four in the morning, um, the night before effectively, holding these huge shopping bags, having used the credit card that I usually kept for emergencies, spending more money in that shopping trip than I normally would spend in closing a year. I think it was like, it was around 400 pounds. Mm -hmm. and, and being like, what? <laughs> what happened? Like, yeah. what happened? Like, I don't even understand what happened. And then just wanting, I guess the question I started with was, what was it about this brand? Like, why did I even care so much about this brand? And what was the marketing machine that had gotten me to this point of spending this money and walking out? Like, what, what was that? And trying to really start with this immediate experience that, that I had had with the other people at queuing and then to kind of think about, okay, what was the narrative that the, the brand was trying to tell with the collection? And then, but what even is it about why people want things that they can't afford? And then like, what even is fashion about anymore anyway? And why am I even intimidated by the idea of this brand? So it just kind of zoomed out. And I guess on the side of that was a real sense of kinship with, with the story of Takata Kenzo, who very sadly, died last year um, of, of COVID and, 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 and died having done his last collection. I can't, I know he was in his late seventies. All I remember is that he showed at Paris Fashion Week um, and then he was gone the next day, which is just sort of extraordinary. And I remember I, I remember I felt so emotional about it because the thing that was so interesting is I didn't really know his story when I started making the show. And like all of my favorite projects, as I, it all kind of unraveled before me, I felt I felt an even deeper connection, not so much to the brand, but to the story that the brand originated from, mm -hmm. like a personal human connection with this man who had moved to Paris, not speaking any French, a, a complete outsider at the time, making clothes in a completely different way. And as an outsider, had found a way to make things fit his own terms. And I found it really, really inspiring. So that that was kind of fueling the journey into, into making the work. And I have to say, out of all the things that I've made, when I think now about adaptation and also about like, both about adaptation, like if, is there a thing I could make in another form? Like if someone was to say, 
hey, Paul, like, here's some money to make, I don't know, a telly documentary or like a, 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 a film version of something. I think the thing I would be kind of curious about how it would translate would be Kenzo. And if I think about the thing that I, I most wish I could just perform again, it, it, it would be Kenzo because I think the other thing that was really amazing about doing it is having made a lot of projects that involve a real like spilling of my heart in, onto the pavement and are about carrying like really heavy weighty issues. It was a show that was carrying like very big questions but it was also just a lot of fun and just a real joy yeah. to perform, you know? I love hearing you say that. Um, I think that's that feels increasingly important, actually, for everyone, that we give ourselves permission in amongst all of this to, to, have, to experience joy and to have fun. And I, I, I've been having conversations with people who basically say, if I'm enjoying myself or I'm having fun, I kind of feel guilty at the moment because of everything going on. And I, I get that, but um, it feels really important. And for me, just kind of looking at you, I look at your Instagram feed and you're just, you you give me joy because you just wear such amazing clothes. And it's just really nice to see something beautiful and to see, um, I'm sure it's probably more complicated for you than this, but it looks like you're just really enjoying dressing up. And it's really nice to be reminded of that. Um, in the way that we used to when we were kids, you know, we just like yeah. enjoy dressing up. <laughs> well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's a, you know, it, 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 it can be a creative act if you want it to be. And yeah. I, I do think it changes the way, the way you feel. And it is, I mean, I guess it also depends like what is your relationship to, to dressing up. But I, but I, for me, there's this thing about who do I want to be? Who do I want to be today? Like, how am I projecting myself? into the world how is that different from from yesterday and like what does it what does it give when i'm facing other people how does it change the way i walk and interact in a space and i think now it becomes how does it make one day feel different to the next and how does it frame myself differently for for each day and it's not i mean i don't think it's so much about i do think the other thing that show actually taught me is that there is there is something about craft in those big brands and there is a there is a theater of the experience of going oh, yeah. into those boutiques which at the beginning of the show I found incredibly intimidating but then through doing these like ridiculous playful interventions where I challenged myself to go into these stores pretending like I was going to buy something with no intention or no money to buy these things I suddenly was like oh wow if I can hold my own in this kind of space I feel I can kind of hold my own anywhere and it's and it's yeah I don't know there's so there was it's the funny, the word story comes a lot, up a lot in the show. And I think, I think there is also something about you want to have something that seems to either tell its own story or you're creating your own story with. Uh, you, you, you don't want to have something that just everyone else has. Or if you do, you want to have your own spin on it some, somehow. But I mean, at the moment, it's funny, like there was a point during the first lockdown where I was challenging myself to, to wear a, a new outfit every day until I kind of ran, ran out of, of uh, steam and had to repeat myself. In the end, I ended up stopping it because of my father passing. Um, and then I've been thinking about returning to something like that. But at the moment, I'm trying to seek a balance between actually, you know what, it's okay if I'm not wearing makeup most days, like lipstick feels like enough of an effort when I feel like it. And as long as I'm putting some kind of thought into what I'm wearing, maybe it is not like my most, my most like creative dressing, but um, there's, I'm allowing myself to kind of relax it <laughs> a little bit now as yeah. well. It, it's sort of, I think, I think actually thinking about, I've had been having a few conversations with people because I, a lot, a lot of people certainly I've been talking to felt that their hope being diminished that they might ever be able to enjoy themselves again, which is a heavy thing to say, but it is a conversation I've been having. People have just been like, wow, I just don't feel as if I'm ever going to laugh again or I'm ever going to feel joyful again. And actually dressing up after a period of just, in, in, in quite a pleasurable way, wearing our pyjamas for eight months has also been pleasurable. But, but I've noticed people are starting to say, do you know what, I, I'm really going to put on some fancy clothes today for that Zoom meeting. And I've sort of really, myself, really been enjoying makeup, which I hadn't for a long time. Mm -hmm. And 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 Paula, some days when nobody sees me, <laughs> apart from me, 
it's still like, I don't know, part of the thing of reminding myself of the how uh, uh, feeling hopeful about being able to feel joy and fun again in a really simple way, as in I can just go to my wardrobe and put an outfit together on, or in my case, I've got a lot of wigs, so I've been having quite a lot of <laughs> wig fun as well. Oh, cool. <laughs> so I think um, that's why I've really sort of I really enjoyed your um your Instagram outfits and just it really remind really helped and reminded me of the fun that we can have you know and the and the joy that we can have so I think it's sort of really beautiful and and important and I like the way that you can you reminded me that it's possible to construct yourself you you can sort of build yourself back up by you know it's like my mum used to say make yourself feel better by putting a nice outfit on it's kind of old-fashioned um wisdom isn't it yeah but it's 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 interesting because i think the first thing it kind of makes me think about is you know i remember there was there um talking to um my really close friend and collaborator chuck blue lowry about this who also definitely really loves loves to dress up as much as i do where she said she was in conversation with a friend who early in the first lockdown saying oh you know like i've got nowhere to wear all my nice dresses to and it's like (laughs) chuck was like wear wear them now like what you know if there was ever a time where if you felt like wearing a ball gown in your room I I think there's something also nice about kind of going what happens when you are really dressing genuinely dressing for yourself generally dressing for the pleasure of like I just feel like dressing for myself not dressing for the impressions of other people but just seeing what happens when you when you do that and what comes out like how experimental can you be with it or how can you see how you feel differently with different colors and so on at the moment i'm really obsessed with um prints i'm always obsessed with prints but i'm but i'm now also obsessed with like textures i'm like okay i've resisted this loungewear thing for a really long time i'm like i'm doing it but my version is oh i want to have like a beautiful like three-piece like knitwear like coordinated set so i'm like all in love yellow and it's all like wool so it's it's like cozy pajamas but it's got a kind of sleek wow. 70s like trophy white vibe about it or something it's like wow. Wow. that's um, awesome I I don't I think it's I love what you said then I just love the idea of us all sitting at home in our in our sort of ball gowns or in our you know um f- uh, floral jumpsuits wearing a fox fox mask or whatever you do yeah. you're sort of experimenting with it I think it's really lovely and you're right like if not now when so yeah I'd like I think we should challenge everyone listening to after they've listened to us to um to experiment a little bit and and dress up a bit and go wild and see how that makes you feel and how much fun it is I am I'm doing that tomorrow I'm going to put together the the most um experimental outfit I can manage which is probably quite experimental as I've been working in theatre for a long time (laughs) there's also a great group I don't know if you've come across it actually I haven't looked at it for ages um but it's brilliant it's a Facebook group called uh Frock Out Friday it's also started in I've spent so many lockdowns I can't remember we started the first or second lockdown yeah um and I but it's basically just a group for for mainly women but I would say it's gender inclusive to post pictures of themselves wearing a frock they really like on a Friday and that's all it is it's like people post pictures of themselves wearing dresses and then everyone in the group goes oh my god you look amazing (laughs) so if you do still feel like you need some some external like feedback on dressing up Frock Out Friday on Facebook is worth checking out that's so nice and that's kind of replaced what you were talking about when people are saying I've got I've got nothing or no one to dress up for that sort of that's uh filled that gap which is beautiful um Paula, I really wanted to talk to you. I know um, that I know, I'm really sorry that I know you lost your dad um, recently. And I wanted to talk to you, if it's okay, about um, your project, which I know um, you, you, you mentioned was something that you did, I think I'm right in saying, as a sort of tribute to your dad. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, are you okay to talk about that? I don't want you to feel be uncomfortable about talking about that project no I think I think I'm uncomfortable to talk talk about that um yeah there was so my my father passed um uh, in May of last year I always feel like I want to say not of COVID which is weird isn't it but I feel like for some reason in in this time when you say someone passes I feel like you need to if it wasn't COVID you need to say not of COVID I don't know why I was just thinking about that it was just 
the strangeness of the time that we're in. But um, my father, my father uh, had dementia and Parkinsonism that kind of uh, seemed to sort of show up in the last the last years of his life, and he he had a accident in 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 my parents' home and subsequently passed. And so it was very it, it was very sudden. It was very unexpected. It was during during the pandemic, um, which obviously felt really difficult because I hadn't seen him in, in some months. Oh. And it was really it was really important for me to think about different ways to commemorate him. And and as someone who maybe as an artist who's very project focused, I immediately <laughs> There was like a, a whole list that came to me right away of like, okay, these are things that I really need to do. Like the, the highest order was um, the obituary. My father had written in a really incredible obituary for his father. It's still framed in his study that I often work in. Um, and so that was that was the first thing. It's like, okay, I need to I need to write an obituary that to me stands up to the level of the obituary that my father wrote for his father. Mm -hmm. And I I I kind of um, structured it. So it followed a similar form to the one that my father had written. So that was kind of project number one, or as um, my boyfriend used to tease me, like the deadline, <laughs> the deadline that my father left me. I was writing yeah. this bitch. <laughs> um, that was number one. Then, the, then as a kind of offshoot of that was my father was a, was a really avid guardian reader. And um, I can't even remember whether it was like my mom or my uncle or both of them like, oh, it'd be so great, you know, if there was an obituary in The Guardian, which I knew wasn't going to be straightforward, but I was going to give it a go. So it's like, okay, so I have to write this obituary, I have to write the obituary um, uh, and I have to, sorry, the eulogy. And then I also have to write the obituary, which hopefully is going to get in The Guardian. And then I had an idea um, for, for an art project. Now, when I came out to my father, when I was, think around 24, 26 years old, um, I came out in, in, the, in, in the most cowardly way imaginable. Uh, my father was an economist, he traveled a lot. Um, I came out to my mother as bisexual when I was 15, subsequently decided I was lesbian. And I never, I never spoke to my father um, about it. But then also like my father was very stereotypically English. So I also just didn't really talk about relationships or emo emotions. Yeah. But it yeah. wasn't, it never really felt so much like I was hiding my sexuality, but it just seemed like if I was never even able to say, I have a boyfriend, I didn't know how to then kind of go forward to, oh, and by the way, like I'm gay. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, and so I, I, despite the fact that I had had many serious relationships and exclusive relationships with women from my late teens and through my, my early twenties, it was only when, um, when my girlfriend and I actually had been living together for a couple of years that I finally hit a point where I was like, I, I can't, I can't like not talk to my dad about this anymore. So yeah. I, I waited um, till he was on a business trip in Kenya where he was going to be for a good two or three weeks. And then I read this really <laughs> rambling long letter explaining how I'd always wanted to tell him and why I'd find it difficult to tell him and why it felt important to me to tell him now. And he just wrote me this really beautiful <laughs> uh, short uh, email, very much in the style of he's a brilliant letter writer that effectively in like a line says, you know, thank you for telling me, but actually I've always really known and I'm sure you and your girlfriend are going to have a really amazing life together. And we're very happy that you are at a stage to move in together. And then he just kind of talks about the weather in Nairobi and like what he's up to in the day. And it was like, it was, I love a, that. It was a perfect response. Yeah. Because right? it was like a, a non-response, if anything, which is kind of exactly the response that, that you want. Yes. Um, uh, and so I was really, when my, after my dad passed, I was, I thought, okay, um, there was an interview with him and show me the money. And so I wanted to do some kind of stream of show me the money. And there was this email. I had to see this interview and I found the email. And as soon as I saw the email, my boyfriend, I showed it to him and he said, oh, wow, you should frame that. And then I became obsessed with the idea of making a print. So in the end, I, I, I made this work, which I would call one of my very few conceptual art works, which is just a, a framed, um, it's a frame of the email you have a choice of either having it um, 
uh, with a matte black frame, which I would say is more my style, or a walnut frame, which is the color of all of the furniture my dad had in his bedroom and his, mm-hmm. and his study. And it, it kind of, I guess, it just speaks to the idea of the kind of coming out response that I would hope all particularly young queer people yeah. would have. Uh, and and all the money from from sales went to split between uh, the dementia UK um, uh, and uh, um, uh, colors, which is a a queer a queer um, charity that runs a festival for young queer people of color. And so those were the kind of two aims that I wanted to raise money for. And there's also now one um, at the Schulis Museum, which is a, a gay and lesbian archival museum in Berlin, which I feel really excited about that it's there. I'm sure my dad would be really amused to know that it's there. And it's, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a really, it's a really important work uh, to me. And the last thing I can say that's quite magical about it is um, when I decided I wanted to make it, obviously, um, I, I had made this decision that I wanted to um, change two of the names uh, in the work. Um, I won't really explain why, but it was just, it was a structural decision as to why. But I, but I wanted my girlfriend's name, uh, my ex-girlfriend's name to be, to be in it. So I contacted my ex-girlfriend to say, I want to make this work. And, you know, after um Ben my boyfriend because he is the master of all layout and design like formatted it beautifully and I send it to Eleni and I was like are you happy with the work and she's like yes it's a beautiful idea and then of course I said and I will send you one you know in exchange for you being okay with it and and so on but then because she's in Brazil um and the post and the world being as complex as it is I sent it to her and the, and the mail they were so awful at the moment that even though it was the right address it was returned to me and I thought I'm never going to be able to get to Brazil I was told you can't even send things by FedEx and so on and then just before Christmas I was talking to one of my colleagues um, at Guildhall where where I teach on a BA course and she was saying oh you know we need to have this meeting before this time because I'm going to Brazil where my partner is and I said do you have any advice about how to post something because I've been trying to post something to a really good friend for you know seven eight months now and I can't figure out how to do it she's like oh it's it's basically impossible but where where in Brazil is your friend because if and on the off chance that it's near where my partner's family is maybe I could take it and Sao Paulo is a huge city and Brazil is quite a large country and by chance my colleague on the first night was staying in an apartment with her brother-in-law a 20 minute drive from (laughs) from where my ex-girlfriend lives in Sao Paulo so I was able to then post the work to my colleague to take with her on a plane to Sao Paulo. Mm-hmm. And then and then Eleni was able to pick it up the next day. And so she had it the week before Christmas. Uh, <laughs> She's insane. Yeah, that's epic, isn't it? That's a kind of whole sub story. <laughs> yes. Amazing. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, I read it and I saw it and it, I just, I thought it was really beautiful and it made me smile um you just get such a lovely impression of your of your dad um he sounds just really lovely I thought it was fantastic and I guess I I found it very affecting as well because I feel like hope I'm hoping this is a positive thing but that death and grief and loss and all of those things in these times are really like in our faces at the moment whether we've experienced loss or the death of a, a loved one or not, we, we will know someone that has. You know, it feels, I know you didn't lose your dad to COVID, but because of COVID, it just feels so present, Paula. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It just feels like, and um, I have spoken to quite a few people on this podcast about it, whose work is about sort of looking at that, who are actually really hopeful about it at the moment and have been saying things like, do you know what? because people are talking, maybe we'll get somewhere now at being better at finding ways to talk about grief, finding, you know, all of that. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about that, if you feel like these kind of epic times we live in have perhaps made it easier to talk about, or is that not your experience? I don't know. I mean, I suppose the interesting thing about losing someone during COVID and I, and, you know, as is, as is the times that we're in, 
and also just life being life. Like I, I, I know quite a lot of people who've lost someone in the last year. And I think what's interesting about it is whether or not you, you have lost someone to COVID in this time, COVID colors the experience of it because it, yeah. it affects, it affects how you grieve, who's able to grieve, whether you're able to travel to grieve, um, how it goes on with like the, the collective trauma and grief that we're dealing with in terms of losing the lives or in fact livelihoods that we had until recently. And so it changes, I don't know, I suppose in some way, maybe it changes the way, the way we're able to talk about it and how open we are about it. But it's funny, like for me, like I, I, between making that piece coming out to my father, but also there's an Instagram project that I made called Morning and Florals, which, which was sort of, I guess, a way of taking that, that Instagram experiment and putting on it on a different outfit every day. And then I was also thinking about my dad had been a, been a gardener and wearing black felt really weird. And I wanted to, I wanted to mourn his death, but being wearing black felt wrong. And so I'd come up with this idea to mourn by wearing floral prints and like somehow matching them to flowers in, in the garden and became this Instagram project. And between posting that and I guess also the um, coming out to my father project, a lot of people contacted me saying they found it really beautiful and cathartic that I was sharing loss so openly. The other thing I've been doing is um, I, 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 change the flowers of an experiment with flower arranging around my father's ashes are in part interred in the garden here and I'm posting pictures of that every time I do it but it it's always striking to me when people say um oh you know it really means a lot to me that you're doing this and it really helps that you speak so openly and it's so generous of you speaking so openly because for me it doesn't feel like any of those things it's kind of just something I need to I need to do I wouldn't know how to be another way with it it's just maybe also I guess I, I'm an artist who seems to be needing to make to to work things out and so these outputs are just me breathing it out and working it out in, yeah. in a way I think I found it really helpful actually I've seen a few people express particularly on Instagram um sort of their loss just being sort of really honest and and I think all of those things are helpful because I think they give other people permission to speak so that's really powerful. Whether that's your intention, I think it's a beautiful outcome that it just makes people go, oh, okay, I can also talk about this. Um, so that feels for me like a really positive thing from social media. I'm hopeful that and uh, determined <laughs> to uh, be one of the people like yourself and many others that make social media platforms a really positive, beautiful, creative space. And you are one of the people that makes that. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, encourage everybody to follow you on Instagram, which I'll make sure is on the um, copy for the podcast as well. Um, sorry, I'm aware I've taken up loads of your time. And also, Paula, there's a very strange, it sounds like there's some sort of thunder god above me. I don't know if you can hear it. There's something really strange going on above me. So sorry if that's... Oh, yeah, 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 a little bit, yeah. It's, yeah, I think maybe Thor's up there. Um, yeah, I wondered if, uh, this is a big one, but just to sort of finish, finish us off in a, in a nice way. This is quite a, tea, a sort of lighthearted, playful question, really. Um, but I'd like to ask all of my guests, if they were to create a utopia or a utopia-ish world, forgetting about the obstacles, forgetting about how do we, what if, all of that stuff, and just letting yourself dream, um, Paula, what would that utopia look like and be like for you? if you could um, have your utopian dreams come true. Oh, wow. <laughs> I know, right? It's wow, what a question. question. <laughs> um, this is always where I start to think, Some I sometimes I really laugh at myself for being um, what I consider to be like too, too literal or not imaginative enough somehow, because I'm sort of thinking, you could be you could be anywhere you could construct any kind of reality anything is possible and the main thing that i feel really preoccupied with is oh i'm really missing being able to go to lisbon uh, which is what i had kind of created as like a regular <laughs> release valve mm -hmm. from my very intense london life for the last few years actually mm -hmm. and so rather than kind of thinking of like this fantasy world because everything is so restrictive in this moment. I'm like, 
I just want to know, I just want to know that I'm going to be able to go to Lisbon again and it's going to be safe and I can be around crowds of people and that's all going to be okay. Like, I just want to know, I, think I just want to know that's all going to be okay again, that that is still a possibility. And I can't even, it's, it's funny because it also makes me think about the fact that I did it. I, I had a lab day with um, my students and this performance and creative enterprise BA teach on and as a provocation myself and Louise Orwin and Conrad Murray who co lead it with me had said, you know, if you can make any kind of work, what would it you know what what would the landscape be and quite a lot of them were like, I want to be able to make the thing that I'm making but not in a pandemic. <laughs> it's like oh but you could have anything. And now I think I understand that thinking. I look like, actually, I'm finding it so hard, Bernadette, to just to just think past this current reality we're in. I, I can't even, I am hopeful about a number of things, but when people are like, oh yeah, we're gonna be in venues in May, or for that matter, even autumn, I'm like, yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah. So it's interesting. <laughs> But the answer in the conversation around that question, it has changed very much since my, April when I started having it. And I'm with you, I think. I'm I'm like, I'm I'm gonna be here and in this here and now space, I'm gonna try and make the best of it because I think there's some power in managing my expectations about the future. And that doesn't mean that I'm negative or pessimistic. It's more about, okay, right here, right now. What is the best, what is the kind of most utopian right here, right now I can have with what I have? Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, no, com com completely. And I think that's healthy. I think that's probably really positive and, and beneficial for us all, given that it was funny, wasn't it, Paula? I, I felt like as the, as the Big Ben chimed for all of us Londoners and we were all sort of cheering at home for the new year, I was a little bit worried because I was like, everybody's acting like this arbitrary time which we've imposed, which doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. Everything's going to change. And like, it's like, yes. I was, you know, I do walk on the sunny side of the street, but actually I was like, yeah, I don't know, you know. I'm wondering whether it might be easy to say, let's just not have any expectations. That's different from not having hope. But, you know, I mean, let's not put any demands on this this new year apart from being where we're at. So I, I, I hear you. And I also think it's really beautiful to just say to ourselves, do you know what I loved is Lisbon. Do you know what I loved is being able to visit my friend in Brighton or whatever that is. And and that's enough, I think. I mean, I guess, that, but then I then I think about it more, I'm like, oh, but if we're really talking about any kind, you know, any kind of reality like I would I would like my dad to be back and I would like I would like to know that I can genuinely have some time out I wish I I I dream of a period where I could say for a year I don't have to deliver anything for anyone and and my career will still be there for me when I come back that I can properly just stop and reflect and think about what is it I want to put in, into the world really rather than just okay, here are some things that I'm interested in exploring and it, to really detach from the machine for a bit. But I can't, I can't quite fathom that either in the same way I can't fathom us being in a venue, seeing a, seeing a show <laughs> in May. So maybe I need to reflect on that. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? I think a lot of people are having similar thoughts about, do I have to keep producing? Can I just not actually genuinely kind of pause and stop and consider? And that maybe this time is a time for us to, to ha find the courage to just say ha is that possible how could I make that just you know mm -hmm. very gently to just sort of investigate that or oh, oh, it's been such a d delight to, to speak with you I really appreciate your time and lots of food for thought which is brilliant um and it's just really it's been really lovely actually having these conversations because it's made me realize the slightly formal nature of kind of interviewing people for a podcast means you get a chance to find stuff out <laughs> in a way that maybe you wouldn't like yeah you know, it's so it's I think that's been that's been such a gift okay and and also I wanted to say for people that are listening uh Paula what's the best way of connecting with you supporting you um finding out more about you I would say the the best 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 way would be to join um my mailing list where I put out a bi-weekly 
newsletter. Um, and I, I have to say, my newsletter is one of the things that I am really proud of redeveloping in the last year because it's not, it's not strictly speaking, a typical artist newsletter in terms of this is a thing I'm making, this is a thing to buy something from, come see my me, 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 me. It is a bit of that, of course, but it's largely, a, I would say more like a, like a bi-weekly kind of cultural digest magazine. So generally it's, wow. yeah, I'm working on this, but also I read this, this is kind of bizarre, isn't it? These are a bunch of things I'm watching on Netflix. This is my favorite um, record at the moment. Um, and also, wow, the clothes in this film periods are super exciting. So I would say join that and you can join that either via, I think the link is in my link tree in Twitter and Instagram and also on my website. And um, you can find me at, at Paula Varjak, Paula, P-A-U-L-A, Ovs, Varjak is like carjack, but with a they. Um, I'm also the only Paula Varjak on the internet. So if you Google me, generally yeah. you find me, but I would say join my newsletter. I really think it's like good fun in your inbox every couple of weeks. That sounds great. It's so generous. Brilliant that you're doing that. It just sounds like a sort of having a cup of tea and, and a chat with you type newsletter, which is really good. So yeah. I'm, I'm not on that newsletter list, I don't think, so I'm going to see to that immediately, Paula. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for your time, and hopefully we'll include an excerpt at the end of uh, one of your audio pieces. And thank you for being patient with my really um, suspect internet connection. It's been lo you. <laughs> lovely to speak to you. I'm going to stop recording now, and then we can okay. carry on talking secretly afterwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So now I've got a treat for you, uh, a short excerpt from one of Paula's pieces, as promised. Have a listen to this, beauty. Memory Link. Escape the restrictions of the present by exploring the freedoms of the past. Selecting PV0023 Riverside Terrace Cafe, Lisbon. a deck chair staring out at the river at that surreal and specific juxtaposition of what looks so much like the Christ statue of Rio Brazil and the Golden Gate Bridge of San Francisco that juxtaposition in clear blue water that reminds you you are in your favorite city Lisbon a place so beautiful that whenever you come here, most of your time is spent just sitting at viewpoints, staring out at the architecture of the city. You can hear tourists speak on either side of you. Fragments of German, English, French clutter around your ears. That was a very brief excerpt of a beautiful piece called Memory Link by Paula Varjak, which you can find on SoundCloud. Um, it's wonderful, she's imagining a sonic technology designed for a future after several successive pandemics where the only way to experience going out is by downloading memories of anonymous individuals from the past. Thank you very much for listening. My name is Bernadette Russell and this is How To Be Hopeful a podcast all about hope in which I investigate hope where we can find it and how we can keep hold of it once we've found it. The podcast is to accompany my book of the same name published by Ellington Thompson. I hope you'll give it a read and I hope you'll come back and listen to more. Thank you for joining us. Bye bye.